Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. I welcome you to The Long Road. I'm here with Bill Prokop. In your position? Assistant City Manager, Human Resources Director for the City of Keene. The, um, today is going to be a little different. A lot of people always say, I never have anything written in front of me or paperwork. But today we're going to talk about the New Hampshire retirement system, the changes. And it's unbelievably difficult. No one knows what's going on. And it's going to come up for a vote tomorrow, um, Wednesday. Correct. And... Um, <clears throat> I'll admit, and I think most people will admit, that the New Hampshire um, retirement system has some serious problems. We at the State House for years have played with the numbers, saying, hey, 9%, 10%, 11% growth, so we as a state didn't have to pay our fair share. Now it's coming back to haunt us, and we as a state are trying to find a way out so we don't have to pay any more or any more in the future. That is correct, and, and I, I also think there's still a lot of finger pointing. It's either the employer's <coughs> fault or the employee's fault, and as you say, it just comes back to the legislature of not addressing issues when they should have. But we have to look forward. Yeah, because when you're trying to blame it on the the employees, wait, wait. it's like a kid. If if you don't tell your your son or daughter to give you an extra five dollars a week for rent, they're not going to give it. Correct. And so the state says, you know what, we'll keep the employees happy, we'll keep our happy, but we were really doing it for own, our own interest because we didn't want to have to, quote, raise taxes or we didn't have to want to make tough decisions up at the state house in the budget. Exactly. And in 2007, <coughs> we did a revaluation re and came up with an adjustment for the employers or the cities and towns to pay their share to improve the, the uh, financial stability of the plan. And, and looked at all the liabilities we had at that time, but obviously it wasn't enough. Well, yeah, and we go back to 2007, but we still came up with a nice rosy figure. Absolutely. And I think we went from 2.7 billion in the hole to about 3.4 billion in the hole. 3.4, 3.5 billion, yes. So, and um, we were talking before. Now some of the projections is that going forward for the next two years, we're going to have an eight and a half percent growth. That's correct, and. My understanding was that the trustees last week voted to bring that rate down to seven and three quarters percent, but the legislature wants to keep it at least eight and a half through up until July 2014. But if I was a private business and you were my accountant and you said it was 7.75 and I decided to keep it 8.5, that's kind of illegal. The stockholders would go after me. I would think so. <clears throat> and um, just one for... Um, Kind of clarification, we always, when we go and look at things that are going wrong, we like to pick on a few individuals and, and we then whitewash it over. Yes, in union leader this weekend, state trooper captain retires, gets about $50,000 extra, and then goes and gets an, another job that was paying more than um, he was doing as a, a captain in state police. You've had a few police sergeants, I mean police um, chiefs who who really worked the system. And on the, on the other side, to, to be fair, if I joined the Marine Corps right now out of the Naval Academy at 18 and 22 and retired at age 46, I would have had hundreds of thousands of dollars in free education and I could look at to collect a pension of over $200 million. So we're not looking at the average person with their pensions like 15, 16,000 we're trying to look at the top and whitewash all the other people who are not really going to have a livable wage when they retire. I think that's one of the big issues. I mean, during the whole discussion going on, there were several retired state troopers and other people who were showing that when they retired, <clears throat> their pension was like five, six thousand dollars. With inflation, maybe it's up to ten or twelve thousand today. But I think the average for the average working person, as you said, is somewhere between eighteen and twenty thousand dollars a year in a pension. And they're paying their medical cost is going up. If they're not a state worker, they're paying for their own health insurance, which is probably costing them at minimum for an individual four to five hundred dollars a month. And if it's a family, at anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a month. So their pension is basically covering their health care. And I think what a lot of people don't understand is police and firemen don't pay into Social Security. 
That's correct. They don't pay into it. And they don't. They're not eligible for Social Security until they earn. They get a job on the outside and earn the credits that they need to for Social Security. And that's usually about forty credits for at least ten years. To that's get correct. It. And so, <clears throat> let's go over some of the proposed changes. Of course, there's all kinds of dates all over the place. Correct. And um, <clears throat> one of the proposed changes is the bump up or the spiking. Could you explain what that is? Spiking, I think, again, is a provision based on very few people in the entire system coming out and saying, okay, they have their earnings, then they take their unused sick time, their vacation time, and any other credible time that they have, and that total will add towards their average earnings, last three years, and if those earnings come out to be over 125% of their base earnings, then that's considered spiking. And now the new spiking provision, which has been now amended to take effect July 1st of 2012, the cities, towns will be responsible for paying up front the cost of what that spiking, anything over 125%. And I, I would give you a, a guesstimate that the average, and this particularly affects the police and fire personnel, and as we were talking earlier, usually the higher paid because of the overtime rates, et cetera. And this could cost a city or town anywhere between $100,000 and $500,000 per Person. employee because you have to take and say, okay, what's over that 25%? and you have to pay the New Hampshire retirement up front as to what their liability would be based on the estimated pension that person would get over their lifetime. So if you had to come up with $500,000, that could be the cost of maybe six or seven patrolmen. Easily, easily. And that's, that's one of the <coughs> and the same would apply to the, to the county and to the school. With teachers, particular, particularly when they have tenure and so forth going on, they may be able, they may be, fun, be hit with the spiking uh, provision as well, not as much as police and fire. The um, <clears throat> and so one of the the special duties, one of the proposed changes is now it's averaged over seven years. That's in the proposal. In yes. the proposal. Yeah. And so that would um, reduce it quite drastically. Y yes, it w it will. It will average. It has to be averaged Average. out over the seven years. Correct. And the other part was, so if your your last year, your special duties couldn't be higher than the previous 12 months or higher than any point in that five-year period? That is correct. <clears throat> and and it's, I think there's another thing, too, that sometimes we overlook or the general public doesn't realize, that where the sick time is a, an accumulation of sick time, most municipalities and towns don't have a short-term disability plan like private industry. Mm -hmm. Private industry pays a short-term disability insurance fee every month and every year for each employee that employee's out, they're out up to 26 weeks normally, then long-term disability kicks in. So there's a, an ongoing fee. What most municipalities have is just people get credits for, for the time that they work, depend on its seniority, and they earn these days. If they're out sick, they use those sick days. Those aren't there just to accumulate towards pension. If somebody has a serious illness and they're out for surgery, they're out for a month, or if it's a female and she's pregnant, she uses that time when she's out of her sick leave. So sick leave is not just something that's, that's stashed away and used at retirement time. Yeah, because the, the, average, the average person, yes, like the, the teachers, they'll use their vacation time, they'll use their sick time, and once that's all used up, if they are taking extra time, it's on their own dime. That's correct. And... <clears throat> And for the average police officer or fireman, fire person, I guess we have to call it now, if they need to take four hours off to go to the doctor's appointment, they write off four hours. That is correct, on their own time. <clears throat> and one of the complaints some of the people have, especially in some of the small communities, is, well, I'm a chief of police, i got to go to the doctor's, but I'm, I'm in uniform and I have my pistol and I have my radio, so I'm on duty, so that doesn't... Um, count as sick time. That's really the start in the system. That Exactly. And the, those are the types of things that obviously need to be corrected in policies. And, and you're right. I think the smaller towns and the towns that are further distance from the main cities or the main f medical facilities have that issue come up regularly. 
and some of the, the smaller towns who can't afford to pay their um, employees a competitive rate wage, you know, it makes it easy to put those special duties on because, quote unquote, it's not really coming out of their pocket, it's coming out of the retirement pocket. It's coming out of the retirement pocket and just recently, I believe it was last year, it's now coming out of the contractor if you're using the special duty for road work or constru a construction project, not if you're doing something yeah. for the town. The, um, <clears throat> and some of the, the other ones, um, there was one, the 85, 100% rule. Correct. That uh, under the new, what's proposed now, if you're vested, which means you have 10 years of service in, in the plan, or you're over age 60, that then you can retire, and the maximum you can retire under is 100% of your er earnable salary. That does not include your sick time and vacation time. As of, uh, I believe it's, and the dates go all over, but I believe it's January 1st. If you're not vested, which means you could have 9.9 .9 years and 11 months of service, then going on when you retire, you can only retire at 85%. So they put a cap, and, and this is where you, the confusion starts getting in because we have the spiking provision for people if they're earning over 125%, but our new rules say you can't have over 100%, and this, then eventually anybody coming up through the system is 85%. So it doesn't make sense for the spiking provision to even be there if you put rules in to eliminate it in the first place. And one of the, the biggest problems, because again, a lot of the public service employees understand it has to be changed because it's in their best interest. They don't want a system that goes bankrupt. <clears throat> They're counting on getting these monies going forward. But to go and say, yes, you've got to have 10 years, it's not like the airline companies who say, when they had their problems, everybody hired after January 1st falls under this new rule. If you had hired before that, you go under current rules. But like you said, you can be nine years, 11 months, and you're th less than 30 days, and it says, tough, you have to go under the new rules. Right, and I think from the employee's point of view is, th is this, that going back to 2007 when the legislature looked at all the liability and said, hey, we haven't been putting enough money, they took everybody that was in the pension system, did a calculation through actuaries, everything else, and said, okay, this is our liability. Now we're coming four years later and saying, if you were on in that count 2007, but you don't have 10 years of service, we're, we're, we're counting all over again. So we counted you once in 2007. Now, and this, again, is, is the concern, I'll say, with employees, particularly between 5 and 10 years of service. They're saying, wait a minute, this just isn't fair. This isn't what I was operating under. And the other thing that I think is important, it's what's happening here is the state is saving its share. It's 35% that it was paying in the past, and this past year, 25% of the cost of retirement for, in, in cities' cases, the uh, firemen and policemen. So what that means, and, and a year ago, the employees and the union said, we're willing to pay more. We also understand that maybe our age uh, uh, limits need to be raised a little bit. That's fine, but let's make the change effective July 1st for all new hires. They, they were very happy to go along with that. For some reason, we didn't want to use, use that, so we came up with the requirements. Now it's 10 years of service, and that's what probably has our unions and our employees more concerned. And again, an employee with 5 to 10 years of service is saying, wait a minute, you know, I've been here 8, 9 years saying, okay, here's what the system, I'm putting either money away because, again, I think sometimes when you read the newspapers or you watch TV, it sounds like the state and the municipalities are putting all this money in. The employees have been paying their share, too. Well, if it's police or fire, they've been paying over 9%, and the regular employees, 5%. So they're putting money away. But, I mean, the municipalities, which is costing taxpayer money, are putting their share in. But it isn't a one-way street. And in this, the whole intent in the beginning was to strengthen the retirement system balance, to do away that $3.5 million liability. By all the changes we're making now, 2% more, it's going from 5 to 7% for all Group 1 employees, and it's going up like 2.5% for police and fire. One's a little bit higher, I think one's 2.8, one's 2.5. But this money 
it's going into the fund and the state is withdrawing its 25 or 35 percent. So the state is going to have nothing in the game any, any, in the future going forward. So the employee's share is, and the employer are going to be the only two. And when the pension plan was set up and gone, people going around selling the system to the towns and cities throughout the last five or ten years, I know a few towns loca locally here that in the last ten years joined the system, they joined because, oh, the state was picking up its share. And that's what they said, oh, this was good. It won't cost us so much. But now they're pulling out. So in the end, the state is saving millions of dollars. But we as employers and we as taxpayers, I don't care what town you're from, the cost is still going to be with us. It's not going away. Yes, the employee's picking up their share a little bit more, and they were willing to do that. But as we go forward, when the cost goes up or the interest rate's too high and there's a shortage, it's going to fall back onto the taxpayer. And when you go back in 2007, <clears throat> I was in the legislature in 2007, and one of the things that we got nailed big time for was being honest. When they, when they go and say, well, you, you increased the budget by 21%, 22%. Well, once you took the state's share of doing what it should have done, the budget only went up about 2%. Almost 20% of the budget increase for that biennial was the state doing what it was supposed to do. Right. And we got nailed. We were one of the worst retirement funds in the nation. And so we had to do it else the system was going to collapse. Correct. And <clears throat> unfortunately, it appears that we may be trying to do the same thing again because we've just, as I said earlier, the, the uh, actuaries have said reduce your interest rate from 8.5 to 7 and 3 quarters, which still seems high. Yeah. But they said you should do that. And our legislature is saying no. We're going to put that off until 2014. 2014 comes, unless we have a fantastic return, we're going to be sitting there saying we're short. We have to make up money we don't have. Why did that happen? Because we didn't have the interest rate. It sounds like it's a repeat of 2007. But if we, if we go down to the 7.75 that the actuaries say, state it is, and their reputation is on the line, especially after coming to the debacles from Enron and everything, they're more conservative. Correct. And, if, and to go in, if we don't listen to them, or if we did listen to them, then we'd have a $100 million hole. That is correct. And so... The hole in the budget. The hole in the budget. Right. And so it's almost kind of like a repeat. We had a $100 million hole in the budget because we wanted to put the, um, the malpractice liability fund in it. Correct. I guess it's just coincidental that it's still the same price. Now we have a different one. It's a different price. <clears throat> and um, part of the thing when we were talking about um, some of them, so the state was supposed to pay 35%. And the state goes and says, what we're looking at now is, so we're going to increase people's contribution by two to two and a half or maybe a little bit more. And so when you look at the cost of medical mm -hmm. and you look at the cost of um, the retirement, a lot of our employees, whether the union or non-union, are going to see a, anywhere from five to seven percent reduction in their paychecks going forward. Yeah, I, I looked at that the other day, just for Keen and a just a ballpark number. Percentages are one thing, but it's going to cost our average worker, and I'm not talking mm -hmm. the highest paid. I'm just saying the average person, whether they're working in public works or the police department or administration, it's going to cost them between eighteen and twenty-five dollars a week out of their check okay. additional it's already costing them probably between forty and fifty dollars so their share is going up significantly and in a year when they all voted not to take an increase so all of the workers in Keene are going to be taking an extra hit this year yeah and to, <clears throat> there are some people that blame it all on the unions well unions only sign contracts that the voters approved or the city governments and county governments approved. They didn't hold the gun at our heads to do it. We, we did it, and now a lot in the public and a lot of the elected people say it was the union's fault that we're in this situation. Yeah, a lot of times it gets blamed on the unions, but the fact is a good 
labor-management relationship is negotiations. And you should both come out saying, okay, I didn't get what I wanted, but I got something that's acceptable and we can live with. And you can read the paper going around the state, and uh, you know, I do happen to feel in Keene we're fortunate with the relationship we have that's been probably built for the last 15, 16 years. And it is so important. You can't just blame the union. Uh, we have to say, okay, what's going on? What's a, what are all of the issues? And there's got to be a balanced approach to it. And, again, you just can't blame it on the public in, employees because if you look at the, the employment report that came out right now from a year ago from this month, there's 3,100 less public employees in the state of New Hampshire. And so government's downsizing and downsizing big. Absolutely. And I can say in Keene that uh, we're probably somewhere between 12 and 15 employees downsize on our side of the size of our workforce, which is probably close to 5%, 5 to 6%. And uh, that's, you know, as long as the public doesn't see a service slipping, that's fine. But the fact is that the public workers are getting, I think in some cases, slammed in the newspaper and stuff about, well, it's about time they cut them. It's, it's not fair to say, you know, we have a, a, a several employees that have 30-plus years of service. They didn't stay with the city just because it was an easy job. They enjoyed their job, and they're doing good work for the city, and we appreciate that. And I think I don't care what you're, whether you're in private industry or you're in working for an, another municipality, your employees are the most important asset you have. And they take up a large percent of our, of our budget, whether it's, again, school, county, or whatever else is. Our personnel costs are very high. We've got to manage that asset. They have to, we have to make it clear what we expect for the, from them, and they have to perform. And that's true anywhere. The, the city, especially the city, the, each employee's productivity is going up drastically. And so, and again, they're going to get about 5 to 6% less in their paycheck going forward. So to go and say that the, the, the city employees haven't stepped up to the plate uh, saying we're part of this community, we want to have a productive community that we're proud of. Yeah, and, and the other thing, there's a lot of studies that go out and, again, get quoted that say, okay, <laughs> municipal employees or I should say governmental employees on average make a higher wage than <clears throat> private industry. That really isn't true. The fact is that if you took, when they do those surveys, they take across the board from a beginning worker at a fast food chain that's coming in at minimum wage, and then they compare that to a municipality. You don't have that type of job. In municipalities, in most cases, you're hiring e either more a higher educated person or a person, if it's in the highway department, you want them to have a CDL license or be able to get it. So the requirements for municipal work is much higher. And when they look at the study of comparing jobs for jobs, government workers are actually 7% lower than private industry. That doesn't mean that benefits are you know, any different. If That's across the board, both benefit and salary cost. And so <clears throat> the, um, one of the goals is to, we're talking about saving money, and we are talking about before, where how the, um, the state, for example, the employee contribution just for the police. In schedule, the state was supposed to pay $50.5 billion, million. Well, in 2014, that number is going to drop down to $35 million. So the state automatically wipes out $15 million of contribution. That's just for the just, police. Just for the police. And um, they're saying that... Um, as, for example, the municipalities, they can drop another $12 million just for police. So we're saying round off in 2014, where it used to be, um, right now it's going to be 67. In 2014, it's going to be um, <clears throat> about 71, but that's about $30 million less. And there's no way in the world, when you look at the number of police in the state of New Hampshire, that they can make up $30 million, <clears throat> excuse me, out of their paycheck to keep the retirement system whole. In a two-year time period. Two year, that's just for that one year. In just 2014, they got to come up with $30 million out of their own paychecks or 
we're still going to have eight and a half, nine, ten percent growth to make up that difference. That's correct, and, and I agree with you. That's just not going to happen. If you just take two percent on all the wages of the police, I don't see that happening. And even if we're going for the system, if we go twenty years out, the state is going to drop down to fifty-one million. And so that's going to be a drop off of $80 million. So in the, for example, the year 2031, the police, just the police, have to come up with $80 million just in that one year. It's like a balloon that doesn't seem to be real and it probably is not going to stay on yeah. this earth. It's going to be in a different planet. And, with, you know, if we pick on Forrest Gump, even Forrest Gump would say, this ain't right. It, it ain't going to fly. <laughs> That's correct. <clears throat> and, um, but the, the part that scares me, the state gets out, out of the business. They're going to mandate that every single employee who works for the state, the city, the county, the schools must join the retirement fund but they're getting out of the retirement fund completely. Yeah, and the, and the other thing, because I think a lot of taxpayers ask, well, if you're so unhappy with this, why don't you just get out of it? Well, basically, you're virtually locked in, because if any <clears throat> municipality wanted to get out right now, first of all, you have to go through a very lengthy written process, which is, say, immaterial. But secondly, you then have to pay the state every bit of liability up front for all the employees that have been paying in that could be vested right now. And in Keene's case, that would be several millions and millions of dollars up front to the retirement system. Cash you, right, check cash up, right front. up front. You then also have to show <laughs> the retirement trustees that you have a new plan in place that's just as good or better than theirs. So now you have to have a new plan that you have to be funding after you've put out millions of dollars. So, and that all has to be approved by the New Hampshire retirement system. So it, there is virtually no way to get out of it, but exactly what you said. The state is telling municipalities and employees, this is what you have to do. We're managing your money, and you have no say. Except now in the revision, there is going to be four municipal members that are, that are chosen to be part of the trustees. There hasn't been any real municipal, municipal involvement at all. And that's changing slightly. But still, the state will be out of, and it's directed, the taxpayer's money is being directed by the state as to how it will be spent, what's the interest returns, et cetera, on a fund that we can't control. And so, say six years from now, the economy's still crap. Then instead of being $3.5 billion in the hole, we're $6 billion in the hole. Then the actuaries come in and say, this is what you've got to make up to make it whole. So the only two people that would have to pay are the municipalities, the local communities, and the employees. Correct. And there's no way, if we, look at, if we add these up, it's about $200 million. Right. And so in 2030, where in the world is the municipality and the um, employees going to come up with an additional $200 million that the state used to put in? And at the same time, when that happens... And let's just say that that's exactly the, the right numbers. Where are the employees going to get the money to pay? They're going to feel that their wages have to be increased, which again is now going to be back onto the employer, which are the municipalities, because the employee is going to say, I can't, keep, I can't afford this, or they have to quit because they can't work in municipal government and have to go outside because they have to pay into the system. And if they quit and they don't have vesting, they lose their, their money. So it, it, it's really a catch-22 here. <clears throat> we'll have to be a little careful with this one, so I don't want to get accused of being ageist, ageism. But to, to just jump on what you said, this could make it possible that we couldn't afford to hire people or people couldn't afford to come and work for us because of the amount of money that they would mandatory have to put into the retirement fund. Well, yeah, th I think, yeah, th that is a very true statement, but at the same time, looking at it from the employer side, we may be paying more in health care and pension costs than we are in wages for, for a, let's say, entry-level position, or we won't be able to afford entry-level 
positions who have benefits because of just the cost of those. Is, it's greater than what the wage demand is. Because if you come in entry level and you make $25,000 a year, looking at some of these numbers, you're going to have to pay at least 10% of your gross salary right into the fund right off the bat. Oh, definitely. Yep. <clears throat> and so if I'm just got married and how can I afford to, to work for you? That's correct. That's, that's, it's, all, it's like you have two <clears throat> apartments or two rentals or two mortgage payments. And then if I come and work, like you said, I have to make a 10 year commitment if I plan on getting any of the money back. Right. And That's so, true. Yeah. You know, I'm going to have to look at that. You know, I'm, maybe government employment is just not that worth it in the state of New Hampshire. Well, I think that, and I think the other thing that we have to just bear in mind, and whether it's people retiring and coming back to work, as you were mentioning the article in Union Leader, we also, from the employment side, we want the best people in the jobs. So the fact is, suppose somebody retired from Ford, and let's say they were head of security, and they'd be a great police lieutenant. Why shouldn't we consider hiring them if they were the number one candidate, had all the credentials, just because they're collecting a pension from someone else? I mean, they don't do that in private industry, just the opposite. If people retire, they're looking, and if they want to start a second career, and they're the best candidate, why not hire them? So I think we have to balance these needs here and say, What's the most important thing? The retirement correct system needed correction, and those, some of those changes are very good and to make it more stable. But I think the troublesome thing here for the employees as well as the employers is the only one really benefiting in this is the state. The state is saving substantial money. And the rest, I don't believe the employer contributions are going to go down like all the projections say, and it's costing all our employees more, which is going to be higher wage demands in the future. And it's really strange. If, as, if I retire as a colonel today and I get a pension for $75,000 a year and I'm under age 50, and if I go work and get a job at $200,000, people say nothing whatsoever. Correct. If I go work for the federal government, and like Colin Powell, you're capped on how much money you make. So Colin Powell lost part of his retirement while he was working for the federal government. To me, that seems like a much reasonable right. manner. So, if my pension, if I, my pension is sixty thousand bucks, and I get a job as a state police captain at ninety thousand, my pension should stop. And then, when I retire, maybe two or three years later, or quit, then the pension picks up. Yeah, right. be a little bit higher, but there should be no way. Like we're talking about <clears throat> the um, state police captain, that I collect both because that just ticks off people. And we can't afford it as, as a um, community. Correct. But the employee, as you said, shouldn't lose it either. Yeah, shouldn't, shouldn't be, okay, it. if you do it here, we're taking it away from you. Yeah, you just put in hiatus until you right. come back. And the question is, 60000 or I get a $90,000 job? Right. And because one of the problems when I was on the school board, again, which ticks people, we, had a, we needed an um, interim principal. He was collecting a pension. He refused to take the job as an interim principal because he didn't want to give up his pension for a while. Right. So we ended up having to pay him per diem days, which was the same amount of money. Again, the start in the system, right. <clears throat> it doesn't pass the smell test. It may pass the legal test, but is it really ethical that right. way? Right, correct. <clears throat> Just raises questions with the public. And again, those are the higher salary people, not your patrolman that works 20, 25 years, not the guy who works on the night crew repairing the, um, the equipment down at Public Works. Exactly. And the, the other part that um, they didn't look at, because in government they don't do it like they do in private business, if I'm a corp head of a corporation and I have 10 departments, I don't look at each department separately. If I go and do something in this department, it may have an effect on all the other departments. But here in government, we just do one thing. So we want to delay people retiring because, quote, unquote, it'll save retirement costs, it'll save medical costs. But somehow, I don't think it really does. It does for the state, but it isn't going to do anything for Keene, Manchester, or Concord. If you have a fireman who works five extra years, and he or she's in their 50s, their salary is going to be much higher. Correct. 
the city's medical costs are going to be much higher because your risk pool is going to increase. Right, and and you're you're paying your your percentage for those five extra <coughs> years as well. There's there's not an it's I mean there's two things that they say the <coughs> pension plan can have an effect on recruiting. A, it's going to have a re effect on recruiting new people to come into government because you say they've got to look at saying making a ten year commitment. It's going to have an effect on police officers from other states as well as fire personnel who maybe wanted to come to New Hampshire because New Hampshire did have a very good system. And again, I emphasize it does it needed to be tightened up. But some of our recruiting tools are now gone. We're going to be the same as everybody else. And every state's having the same, same issue. Thing. And they're all dealing with it differently. The Because um, look on the teachers. The present um, valuation assumption is if you're 60 years old, teacher, 27% of all the teachers 60 years old, eligible to retire, will retire this year. And, <clears throat> but under the new assumption, male, male and female are both the same. But under the new assumption with the new rules, 20.5% of the 60-year-old male teachers will retire. So that's a, that's a big drop. Then right. you're going to have more people Older teachers in the classroom, I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, Right. but if you've planned on your salary structure. And your turnover. Yeah. And turnover. So it's kind of like um, Tom Brady or Joe Montana. You know, if they, if they play 12, 13, 14, 15 years, their salaries get higher and higher, but you don't bring in any new people. Right. And so you can't balance your salary structure. Correct. But on the... Um, on the, the female side, because women tend to earn less or they live longer, only 17% of the pe female teachers age 60 eligible to retire are going to retire. And so, quote unquote, again, you can say it's saving money for the state in the retirement, which the state would no longer be playing into. Right. But it increases employee cost on the local community. And also, right now, the upfront cost of all the municipalities for people retiring, as we've all read New Hampshire retirements, I think doubled at 800 people or something going for retirement by this time this year versus a normal of about 400. All of those people are getting their buyouts. So that is cash going out of all the municipalities to take and pay for that vacation, un un unused sick time, et cetera. So that's another another upfront cost to the municipality. In many cases, municipalities don't have that right now. So they have an increase coming in their pension fund. They're losing some real key personnel, and they're having some upfront cost. Well, if the um, the tax cap gets passed, then it really puts you in a bind because how are you going to pass increase your budget to pay for these buyouts? That's correct. That could that could take the whole amount of the cap in some municipalities. So you have to lay off people just to pay for people who are quitting. Correct. I don't think that was should have been the plan. <laughs> Not at all. And um, when we were talking, right now there's about 50,000 people in the retirement system and there's about 20,000 retired. Right. That isn't a very big pool to pay for the retirees. So if I go and take the 3,100 less people that are no longer working and we look at about another 1,000 jobs that are going to disappear. To be honest, about 700 of them are not being filled right now. But the pension fund is plant based on the people being filled. So that's 4,000 people. We just got another 400 people that are taking early retirement. There are more who are just waiting to, um, to see what happens for that January 1st, 2012. So all of a sudden... You could be looking at 10% of the pool that was paying into the retirement fund gone. just gone in less than a year. That's correct. And you've increased your, your <clears throat> pay, payout because now you're paying your pension cost of what's being paid out of the fund is accelerated because of the doubling of your retirees. So you, you increase the amount of retirees, you decrease the number of employees, you overinflate the projections and say by 2013, end of 2013, everything's going to be good. Yes. You buying it? No. <laughs> you didn't even... <laughs> Not at all. 
But it's all about, um, we went up to New Hampshire, the State House this year, to talk about improving the economy and, and, and creating um, new jobs. Well, <clears throat> to me, I don't think this is creating jobs, especially at, at the local level. No, and I think at the local level, what this, unfortunately, and I, I know this wasn't the intent, but what it's re really created is a lot of uncertainty and confusion by the employees. I mean, we just had recently four police officers retire, and, and with significant amounts of service, if I think almost every single one well over 20 years. They didn't retire because they wanted to. They retired because of the uncertainty and better to take what they knew they had right now. And we're going to have more. And this is going to, you know, is true until this is settled down. And, and the big concern is, okay, if we put a Band-Aid on it this year and do what we're doing, a year or two fr from now we'll be back doing more adjustments. And as an employee, is that go back to that employee with nine years and ten months of service, what am I going to have? Does the vesting get changed to 15 years next time around or 12 years next time around? So there's just a lot of uncertainties been created, and yet the employees have to pay more. So it's, you know, they're, they're paying more for something that they're not as comfortable with as they were a year ago. The, as we talked earlier, the employees understand it and they're willing to pay more, but they would like a degree of certain, certainty. They'd like to be, be at least assured, okay, if I'm here now working, and I'm on board and I'm here five years from now, I'm not going to be told again that there's another change that affects me that's different than what I thought I had. And you had talked earlier about um, people really don't complain until they see a drop off in services. Um, <clears throat> but if, if I want to come to, to New Hampshire as a businessman and now I start looking at the numbers, the crime rate may be going up, the, the fire, the insurance rate for fire is, is going up because we don't have as many firemen and it, it's a quicker, it's a longer reaction time. All well, the quality of the schools go down because we don't have as many teachers. Those are a lot of the factors I look at before I come to open a business here. Everything's interconnected. We, we, it's a knee-jerk <laughs> reaction. You, you've got to look at all of that. What's happening with the declining school populations? What's happening with this, what's the services that community has? You know, what is the crime rate? What's the transportation availability? What's, what's provided for the elderly? What's provided for young? What's the park and rec programs? All of that goes into a businessman's decisions as to why they should move. And um, it, it's like we just want to find a, an easy way out, a quick fix. It's a political way. As long as it just appears like we're correcting something on my watch, it makes me look good, and it's your problem in the future. Right, and I think that if we all walked <clears throat> away from this saying, okay, our pension liability in two years, everybody could predict it's going from $3.5 billion down to 3 or 2 and a half, we'd all feel better and say, okay, it's stronger, it's going to be healthy. I have not heard anybody say, with all these changes we're making, it's going to affect the, the liability. We're still going to be at 58%. You know, may, and be okay, some projections say we might go up to 60 or 62, but it's not 80 or 85%. And I think that's the, the, that's the thing that, that's probably the most distressing of all this, is how do we make sure that that pension fund is safe for the employees who are in it and are counting on that for retirement? And, um, <clears throat> yeah, because as I kept looking at these numbers and going through this, 28 pages all over the place. Printed didn't print out very good, but we were talking it. Prior to January, July 1st, 2011, July 1st, 2010, September 1st, and it just didn't make any sense. And whose fault is it going to be if the employee, the employee who wants to retire gets the wrong information and has a financial loss? Yeah, this is going to put a lot of burden on the New Hampshire retirement personnel to be able to answer these questions. And again, I don't know how they just practically can have so much of this put in place by July 1st, which is a few weeks away, when it isn't even passed yet. And, and they have a lot of people with questions. Okay, the employees have until December 31st to make that decision now. 
But uh, there's so many things that, as you said, interrelate here as to, you know, was your union contract in place by January 1st, 2010? Were you an employee in 2009? July 1st, you're going to be paying more of this year, but you, have, you can't ret or you can retire, but you have until January 1st, 2012. So there's a mixed match of dates. People have to go through it, read it very carefully, and get really good guidance from the New Hampshire retirement system. When, when I looked at this, it says the employee rate for 2012, for example, all employees, let's, let's pick on the fireman. The employee rate is 28.25, and it's scheduled to be 28.25 in, in 13. Now with the proposed changes, it's still going to be 28.25 in 12, but then that's the first half. But all of a sudden, the, employee, the employer rate drops down to 20.53. The... Again, it doesn't pass the, the, the smell test. You can't go and say, right now, we just finished the Keene budget, and then we're getting ready to, you know, we'll start ready for next year's budget. So if we sat down, did a budget saying that as for firemen, we have to pay 8% less into the retirement fund, policemen almost 7% in the retirement fund, and if we built the budget based on these numbers, we'd be in a world of, of crap because these numbers can't be realistic. Correct. Or we'd be fine for 2013. When 2014 comes, we'd be having huge increases because it wasn't covered in the previous year. Because so we, we can't rely on those numbers at this point until the actuaries come and say, here's what the real numbers are. Because if we're $3.5 in a hole, and we require the employees to go up to two and a half percent, while the employer drops seven and eight percent. Simple math doesn't add up, correct. and the state is out of business. That the is state correct. doesn't play in here. That's correct. So, if the state's supposed to pay thirty-five, and they're not going to do it, the employees go up, say around three percent, and the cities go down eight percent. I'm just kind of, I'm confused on those numbers. I'm pretty good at numbers, but they... It doesn't add. It doesn't add. <clears throat> and the, what makes it even worse, the New Hampshire, this is the fiscal impact. The New Hampshire Retirement System and Department of Administration Service state this bill as amended may decrease state, county, and local expenditures by an indeterminate amount in fiscal year 12 and each year thereafter. There will be no fiscal impact on the state, county, and local um, <clears throat> revenues. How you go and say it may, it may decrease. There's nothing that says it's going to decrease. Not at all. This is just political lawyer cover. Well, and I believe, and I believe the numbers were that prior to the actuaries doing their work that they did a couple in the last month, that the liability was going to, was projected to, what you were just reading, to decrease a total of $166 million. After the actuary said you've got to lower the interest rate, that dropped to $61 million. It's $100 million. It's a $100 million shortage. So <clears throat> by us saying we don't want to address that, we're putting that off to 2014, we're artificially inflating the liability by, or deflating the liability by $100 million. Yeah, because the New Hampshire retirement system states that the majority of the provisions in this bill do not impact entitlements to or the amount of benefits payable under current law to the members vested on January 1st, 2012. So <clears throat> if it doesn't affect any of the people that are already vested as of next week, there is no cost savings whatsoever. Right. And we, most, of the peop, most of the people in the system already are vested. And the people that are losing their jobs are out of the unvested people. That is correct. Um, <clears throat> the system actuary has assumed there will be no grandfathering of provisions on the current law except to the extent specified in the bill. The system's actuary estimates fiscal impact is based on June 30, 2010, actuary violations, but we've already got 3,100 less people than we had that are 
that have lost their jobs, been laid off, than 2010. Right. That's about six. That's about three percent of the pool. So it's got to have an effect. It it has to have an effect. Assumes an annual rate of return of eight and a half percent and wage inflation of 4.5% a year and uses the entry age norm cost variation method. <clears throat> so again, we're looking at no changes to the people who invested using 2010 data, which is over 3,000 people less. If you look at the retirees, so 4,000 people less. 